Welcome to the United Stands. I'm Mark Goldbridge and I'm joined by Fabrizio Romano this afternoon. How are you doing, Fabrizio? Hello, my friend. All good, all good. Thank you. Everything perfect. Thanks for the invitation. No worries. Uh, obviously, we've had the transfer window. Uh, I want to get into a couple of bits, but I also want to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the deals that didn't happen and, and maybe why they didn't happen. The Scott McTominay's, the Harry Maguire's, the Donny van der Beek may still happen. But let's, uh, before we get into all of that, um, uh, let's start off and we'll talk a little bit about the takeover. But let's start off with Jaden Sancho. It's been a really interesting week for Manchester United. Uh, obviously, Eric Ten Hag's comments. Jaden Sancho's kept his post up all week, which many Man United fans think is a little bit weird if you want to stay at the club. What is the situation with Sancho, as you understand it, Fabrizio? And, and has there been an attempt to try and sell him this summer? Because I remember you said on one show in the summer that if someone had paid 50 million, United probably would have took that. Yeah, United were open to discuss, but only at good conditions for them. So a loan deal was never a possibility, not even after the uh, problem between Sancho and Tenag after the Arsenal game. So that Saudi possibility was never that close or that concrete. It was just some intermediary trying to offer a solution to both United and Sancho and to find a way. But on Sancho's side, on United side, the loan deal was not making any sense. And also Aletifak already signed um, Di Mare Gray in that position. So that deal was never going to, to happen, honestly. But I think during the summer, there was some possibility in terms of discussion. It was just a discussion. For example, when May United discussed with Chelsea about the Marco Curella deal, in that case, the name of Jadon Sancho was one of the possibilities mentioned uh, between the two clubs, but was never concrete because Chelsea's top target was Cole Palmer. So they were already in advanced negotiations to sign Cole Palmer. And so Sancho was never close to joining Chelsea. But Sancho has always been in a 50-50 situation this summer at Manchester United. But they were only prepared to let him go at good conditions, not on a loan deal and not for a, a normal amount of money. They wanted an important amount of money or, or nothing. So that was my United position. And I think it remains the, the situation around Jadon Sancho, probably also for generally transfer window. Obviously, let's see how the situation will go between Ten Hag and Sancho in the next weeks. What do you think uh, Sancho's position is in it, on, it, on it for Britsia? Because all we've had from him is the, the post where he clearly is saying that the manager's not telling the truth because the manager said he's not trained well. He says, I have, I'm being scapegoated. Um, do you think from Sancho, everyone just assumes that Sancho wants to stay at United, but it could be that he is also thinking about his career and looking at, at, at moving as well. I think Sancho wants to play football. That's the point. Sancho wants to play. Sancho, Sancho joined United because his expectation was to go at May United and to be a regular starter, a crucial player for May United. Then we know that there were some issues last uh, last season and last year. And let me say that in that case, Eriton Hag, in my opinion, did an excellent job to help the player because it was a really complicated situation on the personal point of view. And Ten Hag and the coaching staff tried to help the player in the in the best way. Uh, yeah. And now, uh, honestly, the, the message I'm getting from people close to Eriton Hag is that they were absolutely not satisfied with the situation in training with Jadon Sancho. On player side, the position is different. He probably believes that uh, Eriton Hag has different kind of ideas on the starting eleven, And so that's why Sancho is not that motivated. So I think it's normal to have this kind of situations in football, honestly. I know that it's May United and probably when it's May United, we always have uh, a bigger impact in the, in the media in these kind of situations. But I think it happens in football sometimes to have players not so happy with their current situation. I'm sure that this week something is going to happen because from what I'm hearing on both player and coaching staff uh, sides, they want to discuss, they want to have a talk, they want to understand the best way to make the situation different and to continue together because it makes sense for Jadon Sancho, but obviously also for Manchester United. So I expect Sancho to have a direct discussion with Aiton Hag and with people of the coaching staff because we always mention Ten Hag and obviously He's the manager, but there is also someone in the coaching staff who wants to clarify his position with uh, Jadon Sancho on the training sessions, on the attitude of the player. And then we will see how it will, how it will continue. But for sure, Sancho will speak to Ten Hag and the situation will be discussed very soon. Yeah, it's sort of like it's a manager that um, isn't happy with the way he's performing, but then Sancho's sort of like feeling, even if I perform, I'm not going to get in the team. So, yeah. Um, with the uh, the sale, just very, very quickly, there's been something come out this afternoon about uh, Sir Jim Radcliffe saying he's still in the sale process. Um, I think people are just so desperate to get this sorted out and it's gone very, very, very quiet. We used to get updates almost every week and um, yeah. it's just been so quiet. Uh, anything from your side, Fabrizio, that you're hearing around whether we will be sold or not be sold or any updates? 
Look, at the moment, as I mentioned already, I think it was two weeks ago here here with you, um, I'm getting the same kind of answers. So they don't want to comment. And I think this is very normal after what happened in February, March, and April, as you mentioned, that was very uh, strong in the media uh, with a big impact and nothing happened. So this is why people close to Serge and Radcliffe and same with people uh, close to Sheikh Yassim, they don't want to comment about that. I think they're a bit frustrated with the timing. So it's also normal to see this kind of, of situation. But at the moment, uh, still nothing. Nothing concrete, and I think the best way to to respect this process and also to respect May United fans is to update when something really concrete is going to happen and when there is some confirmation on on the investor side. So at the moment, still nothing uh, confirmed and still no direct comment. So I think the only way is to to wait and see. But nothing is happening right now. Let's talk about Donny and a few of the exits that didn't happen. But before we do that, I know it's still a few months away, the January transfer window. There's always this feeling in the fan base that when we the transfer window doesn't go the way we want in the summer, we might be able to do stuff in January. Um, you're the expert on this, Fabrizio, but we struggled to get a loan deal done for Amrabat. I don't think under the current Man United regime, they'll do anything better in January than they did last year, uh, i.e. loans for Veghorst, because the money's not there as far as I'm concerned, and unless they sell to buy. I think this is the reality. Uh, so let's see how it's going to be, of course, the first two, three months of the season for May United, what they will need in January. So obviously now it's too early to predict the January transfer window, but I agree with you. I don't expect anything super big to happen in, uh, in January. Also because May United are very satisfied with what they did in the summer transfer window. They they wanted Mount, Amrabat, Hoylund, all the players they signed are players that they really wanted. So they are pretty satisfied with the, with the squad they have. Then we have to see what's going to happen with the Sancho situation, with the Anthony situation. Of course, it's going to be important to see uh, if these players will be available in the next months or not. So this is a crucial point, I think, to understand what's going to happen, especially in the winger position for the, for the January transfer window. But at the moment, my United are satisfied with the squad they have, and I don't expect anything super big to happen in the January transfer window. Maybe there could be some opportunity. As you mentioned, Fagors was an opportunity uh, last year, uh, and maybe yeah. these kind of names can, can return in January in case my United need. But I agree that they are not going to do something uh, super, super important because at the moment the, the idea is that the squad is very good and they can arrive to the end of the season with a current squad, maybe with some opportunity in, uh, in the January transfer window. Um, a couple of players I wanted to ask you about. Obviously, you spend so much of your time around transfers. Um, Harry Maguire is an interesting one. He's played for England at the weekend. He actually came on against Arsenal because there were so many injuries. And Gareth Southgate is talking up, oh, you should get some game time now because there's so many injuries. It's ridiculous that an England manager is excited about an injury crisis at Man United. But I don't think Varane's going to be out for that long. Lindelof and Martinez, I think, are fit. So, Harry Maguire, why do you think that deal didn't happen for Brits? So what did you hear? Because we know West Ham, I think that was agreed with Man United and then yeah. it just never happened. Why is Maguire still at Man United from what you know? I think in that case, uh, there were some issues with the salary. So I think it's also normal. Now I know that, again, as I mentioned before, when it's Man United, when it's Harry Maguire, there is lot of uh, comments on social media, big impact on social media. So it's normal to have this kind of stories. But trust me, it's very normal when an important player with an important salary like Harry Maguire is leaving an important club like Man United and trying a different kind of chapter. So joining a club like West Ham, they are not playing Champions League football. So it's completely different kind of, uh, of salary structure is normal to discuss about the payoff, to discuss about the salary structure, to discuss about the contract. So the deal was agreed between clubs, £30 million, pounds, and West Ham also returned in the final week of the transfer window with a loan proposal for Harry Maguire. So the deal was different in the space of two, three weeks, but the £30 million pounds deal was agreed. And in that case, there was no agreement on the payoff, on the salary structure of West Ham, and so the deal didn't happen. Then when West Ham returned for a loan deal in the final days of the transfer window, from May United, it was a no, because mm, when they agreed on the permanent transfer, May United were very close to signing Benjamin Pavard. Benjamin Pavard wanted to go to Manchester United. The deal was almost done on player side and was advanced on club side, because May United were prepared to pay probably what Inter at the end paid for Benjamin Pavard, something in the region of 30, 32 million euros. So to put the money from Harry Maguire on Benjamin Pavard and to change their defense with that kind of signing. But the deal didn't happen because of the Maguire situation. And then in the final days of the window, to let Maguire leave on loan, it means that First of all, you have to agree on how to share the salary. And on that point, it was not easy to reach an agreement with West Ham. But also, May United didn't have time to find a player who had May United level in the final three, four days of the transfer window on loan. And so that's why 
they decided to to say no and to continue with Adam Maguire at least until January. And uh, we're going to talk about Donny in a moment because he could still go. But just uh, on Scott McTominay, again, he was another player that uh, was apparently had interest from Bayern, but certainly West Ham were interested. And I think Fulham in the final days, he then didn't play. Uh, he wasn't in the squad for the Arsenal game. Apparently he was ill. Um, but he's then next day with Scotland. So the, 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 the rumour was that United would have done a deal for McTominay. But again, did you hear anything about why? Was that the player not wanting to leave? Was it, again, about timing? Because... Seems to be a lot of interest in McTominay and he's a long way down the order and Amrabat's here now. So it seems strange that that deal didn't get done. Yes, I agree with you. But also at the same time, I think the numbers of McTominay, for example, when he plays with the national team and also he feels he's an important player. So before accepting a move, he wants to make sure it's the best move for his career. So at one point when Bayern were interested, it was more on Thomas Tuchel's side than club side. Uh, so that's why that Bayern story was never that advanced because on club side, they wanted to go for a different kind of player. But McTominay was in the list of players appreciated by Thomas Tuchel. And with Bayern, I think the player was very open to making that move uh, happen. When it was about West Ham uh, with Man United, there was no agreement. So West Ham never agreed a fee with Man United for Scott McTominay. They also offered £30 million pounds, but was not enough for Manchester United to accept. And in the final hours of the window, Fulham were really keen on signing Scott McTominay. That's the reality. I think that deal uh, was very advanced between clubs from what I'm hearing because Fulham were prepared to put some part of the money they got from the Palinia deal from Bayern on Scott McTominay. But from what I'm hearing, it was the player to say no. So Scott McTominay didn't want to join Fulham. He preferred to stay at Manchester United and then maybe to consider his future in January or next summer based on the proposals. But on deadline day, Fulham were really serious in this deal for Scott McTominay, but didn't happen because of the player's idea. Brilliant, brilliant. And the last, I've saved until last because there's still a, an opportunity for Donny to go. And look, I love Donny. We've spoken about Donny for years. I remember when we spoke about Donny when we didn't even think he'd come to United. And it's not, obviously not yeah. worked out. And he is still really liked. But in fairness, I think McTominay and Maguire, they do get a bit of bad press because they're still at the club. But Donny is a player that is clearly not part of Ten Hag's plans and he's still at the club. Uh, what's the latest with Donny? And do you think um, do you think he might st stay now until January or do you think there is something? Well, it would have to be Turkey, wouldn't it, I think? Yeah, but I think at the end there is a very good chance for Donny to stay until January also because Donny doesn't want to make a move just to say, OK, I will be away for six, seven months and then I will return. This is not in Donny's style. And also, if he wanted to go to Turkey, he had some possibility to go, but he wanted to play Champions League football. And he had that possibility. And now it's no longer possible because of the Champions League list already closed also in, uh, in Turkey. So I think at the moment, uh, this Donny story with Turkey is not that concrete. It was a possibility a couple of weeks ago, but the player were not, was not so keen on that kind of, of move. So I expect Donny to stay. Let's see if till the final day in uh, in Turkey, but at the moment is nothing concrete or, or advanced. And let me say that with Real Sociedad, the deal was really close at one point, but really, really close. And it collapsed because of May United. That's the reality because Donny agreed on everything with Real Sociedad. He wanted to go there. It was probably the best opportunity for the player to change city, country, league, to have different kind of motivation, to try something different and to play Champions League football at Real Sociedad. So it was a very good opportunity. He wanted to go there, but May United didn't agree with Real Sociedad on the terms of the deal. Uh, so it was about the loan fee, the salary coverage. Real Sociedad have a completely different salary structure than Manchester United. So they were not able to pay like 60 or 70% of the salary of, of Donny van de Beek. And this is why the deal collapsed between clubs. But Donny wanted to go to Real Sociedad. So that's why I think it's very difficult to convince Donny to make a move to, to Turkey in the final days of their uh, transfer window. So my expectation is for Donny van de Beek to stay and maybe to reactivate Real Sociedad opportunity in, uh, in January or maybe some different club to enter the race. But I think he will leave in January. Brilliant, Fabrizio. And just quickly from me, very finally, it's got nothing to do with Man United. Well, hopefully it will do one day, but uh, you are Italian-based. Uh, Victor Osman, has he signed his new deal at Napoli? And is there going to be a release clause in that? He has not signed yet, but Napoli remain very confident that this will get resolved very soon. So they remain optimistic. He's not signed and he's not completed yet. There are still some clauses, some details to discuss after he received an incredible proposal from Saudi. So now Hosiman wants an important salary, but the discussion is very advanced with Napoli and the expectation is to agree on a new deal very soon. 
But to answer your question, I think there will be a release clause included in the contract. It's one of the points they are discussing, this release clause, the value of the release clause, how to activate and when to activate the release clause in summer 2024. But from what I'm hearing, there will be a clause in the contract of Victor Osimhen. So let's see uh, the details of this, uh, of this story in the next weeks. But I think this is going to be a very interesting one to follow because probably summer 24 is going to be very interesting for, uh, for Victor Osimhen. Yeah, you definitely need a release clause with Napoli, don't you? They they are very good at selling if there's not one. Yeah. Um, Fabrizio, you've been an absolute legend. I really appreciate that. I, I really wanted to talk about that after the transfer Thank window you. anyway, about some of the some of the uh, finer details of deals that didn't happen. Um, but thanks for coming on again. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. See you soon. And uh, thanks a lot. Ciao. See you later, Fabrizio. Thank you very much. Bye, bye, bye. Um, so yeah, look, lots, lots to get into there. I mean, obviously we spoke about a lot. I've been wanting to do that show with Fabrizio and I, I always wait until the transfer window is closed and we got some absolute uh, nuggets in there, didn't we, about McTominay and Donny and Maguire, which I think we'll just summarise in a moment. But obviously in relation to the sale, absolutely nothing going on. And ultimately as well in relation to Jaden Sancho, I think Fabrizio put it really, really well. I don't need that in here anymore. I think Fabrizio put it really, really well. You've got a you've got a, you've got a manager who is expecting more out of Sancho in relation to effort and um um you know ability in training. But you've probably got a player who feels like doesn't matter what he does, he won't be in the team anyway. So therefore it's um you know it, it's a bit either or. But uh what I'm so, so pleased with that. I'm sure it's going to be going all over the aggregator accounts now. So in relation to Donny van der Beek, it was Man United. We'd heard this, but it was Man United who stopped the Sociedad deal. And it's very likely that Donny van der Beek will now be staying at Man United till January. I think a lot of people forget that Donny van der Beek is here and that he might go Turkey. Donny van der Beek is probably going to be staying till January. So interesting around him. Obviously, Sancho will be as well. Donny van der Beek wanted to go to Sociedad. They couldn't afford to pay half his wages so therefore United said no were they right to do that were they wrong to do that I mean ultimately is it not better for somebody to be paying at least 20 30 percent of his wages for a player that's not going to get any game time I mean for Donny he's got no chance has he he's got absolutely no chance of playing football with the amount of attacking midfielders we've got in relation to Scott McTominay though very interesting update from Fabrizio there and this is the great thing you can have you can hear rumors but until you get it from someone like Fabrizio saying it on the video there, Scott McTominay turning down the move to Fulham. Felt that he was better at Manchester United. So Fulham came in. They were very, very interested. But McTominay, no. Man United were there to do a deal with Fulham, wanted to do a deal with Fulham. They rejected the West Ham deal. We know that. £30 million. They rejected it. I'll never understand that. I'll never, ever understand that. That, for me, will go in there as one of those things in football. I'll never understand. We rejected the West Ham 30 million quid. Would he have gone to West Ham, though? I don't know. Maybe he would have done because of Europa League football. But Fulham was not good enough for McTominay. Uh, according to Fabrizio there, it was the player that didn't make that. So when you're picking the pips out of the summer transfer window and trying to understand why these players are still at United, um, you know, United wanted to sell McTominay. He wouldn't go to Fulham. Bayern weren't that interested. And obviously West Ham had their bid rejected. So look, I don't get it. I really don't get it. It seems to me like some of these players think that turning up for training at United is playing a game. Um, all right, you play for your national team, but you're not playing for the first team. You're not part of the first team plans. You're waiting for an injury crisis. You could be playing week in, week out for Fulham. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Fulham's midfielder nearly went to Bayern Munich and was interesting Liverpool and Arsenal. So what's wrong with going to Fulham? Uh, we wouldn't have got more from Fulham, so why reject West Ham, says Cameron? Who knows what Fulham were looking to offer? But of course, I think Fulham would have sold Pelina, so maybe we'd have got 35. Uh, in relation to Harry Maguire, um, uh, Fabrizio basically saying there that, look, again, agreed fees between the clubs. Um, Man United obviously wanted Maguire to go, but it came down to the settlement of the, of the payout that Maguire wanted. Um, obviously, he's on 200 grand a week at Manchester United. And West Ham couldn't pay that. So therefore, Maguire was looking for a bit of a payout from Manchester United. I mean, ultimately, this just comes down to this. This could, this just comes down to what we're talking about all the time. You just wouldn't have this with a Qatari ownership or a proper ownership if this was Man City's owners or Newcastle's owners or Chelsea's owners, probably even Arsenal's owners. You just wouldn't get this. And I say Arsenal because Ozil's gone. Aubameyang's gone. 
Like, they will get rid of players that the manager doesn't want. But United, what a weird way to run a football club, keeping players the manager doesn't want because of money. I mean, give Maguire the five million and get him out. But no, no, let's keep him. It's it's crazy. Of course, we know West Ham went back in for a loan deal. But at that point, Man United couldn't replace Maguire anyway. But really interesting what Fabrizio said. Man United agreed the deal with West Ham and they had Pavard lined up and Pavard wanted to come to United. So, look, we could have had Benjamin Pavard at the club and not Harry Maguire. And I don't care who you are or what you are or what you think. That is a huge upgrade on a player that can also play at right back as well. And we'd have made a bit of profit. So, yeah, um, it, it, it's really, really surprising how United, um, you know, it's the finer detail of what United did to you know, screw up this transfer window in a way. And Amrabat obviously happened right at the end of the window because we had no money left and we had to do a loan deal. But you look at United and the way they dropped the ball on Maguire and they dropped the ball on McTominay. I mean, the £30 million offer for Maguire, if they'd have given Maguire the £5 million he wanted, there's still £25 million there. That's roughly what you'd pay for Pavard anyway. And if you sell McTominay for 30 that gives you more money anyway to do the Amrabat deal and a little bit more that you paid for Maguire, for Maguire off anyway. So I just, I just, I don't know what United were doing. It was almost as if they thought it was all going to work itself out in the end and it didn't, did it? So yeah, look, it's only what we know. Ten Hag wanted Maguire, McTominay gone, probably wanted Sancho gone if the right money came in, certainly wanted Donny gone. That didn't happen either. So it's weird. Four players is a lot. Four senior players is a lot of players to still having turning up for training that you didn't want there, isn't it? And, and I think this is why, and I said this yesterday on Twitter, name me a manager who's had a more difficult start to their managerial career than Eric Ten Hag. I mean, the list, you could write a book on the last 12 months, comes into the club, and let's not forget, above all this, is the Glazers and their total and utter incompetence. Comes into the club, uh, first of all, Ronaldo issue, which is public, uh, an interview, walking down the touchline, has to you know remove Ronaldo. Um, the January transfer window didn't get backed, no money left, had to watch players he wanted, like Jao Felix and Gakpo, go to other clubs, given Valt Weghorst and Sabitza, still manages to win a trophy and get his top four, comes into the summer expecting new owners, Total uncertainty all summer as the Glazers keep flirting around but not doing anything. The goalkeeping situation was a joke. I mean, who was at fault for that? We don't know. The summer transfer window, you know, the, the Mason Greenwood situation above all that, the Anthony situation now, the Jaden Sancho situation now, four or five senior players that he wanted to get rid of and the club can't back him to do that. So they're all still at the club. Every other club in the summer transfer window, you know, having more stable summers than us. Bad start to the season again. Bad start to the season last year. Um, I've probably missed four or five things as well. It, it, and that's all in his first 12 months as a manager. And yet you've got people going, don't think he's the right man. Don't think he's the right man. I'm like, bloody hell. He must have broad shoulders because he's had to carry a lot of problems. Um, and you just wonder how many of those... Look, the Greenwood, the Anthony situations, I don't think anything you can do about that as a manager. But... You know, how many of these situations around him could have been dealt with by better owners and better people above him? Lots of them, I think. Uh, why does Eric Ten Hag never complain about what the Glazers do to the club? He also said he was happy before getting players in, says Texas. Mate, he's an employee of the club. Um, you know, even Fabrizio said there that United are happy with the summer transfer window they've had. Well, nobody in that club's going to say they're not happy. Even Eric Ten Hag is employed by the Glazers. Like, um, it's our job as fans to call out the club for its incompetence. You're never going to get a Man United player come out while they're under contract saying the Glazers are rubbish, the board are rubbish. Why, why, is, why is Maguire and McTominay and Donny still here? And why haven't we got better players in? They'll be thinking it. They'll say it privately, but they'll never say it publicly. And neither will Eric Ten Hag. Because, and why, you know, why would they? Um, Sancho got scapegoated to cover a tra uh, terrible transfer window. This is pizza. New owners sell Deadwood, buy Evan Ferguson. Do you think this is possible by the 1st of September 2024? Says Charlie Max. Well, that's why I asked uh, Fabrizio about the um, Osman um, contract, because I wasn't aware that he'd received a massive offer from Saudi Arabia. I, I mean, look, there's some players that have gone to Saudi I don't agree with, but Victor Osman going to Saudi would have been ridiculous. He's, he's got the potential to be one of the best strikers in the world over the next few years. Um, but he's about to sign this new contract with Napoli, which we believe will have a release clause, and Fabrizio confirms that. There's two really good strikers up for grabs next summer, 
Evan Ferguson and um, Victor Osman. Now, we've got no chance of either of those under this current regime. But if we can get sold, I think we've got a great chance of getting Osman or Ferguson. Um, why would you want to do that with Rasmus? Because Martial is not the long term solution and you need two strikers. So, look, I, I'm very, 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 very happy with Rasmus. And I think he's going to be a brilliant, brilliant striker. But if you want to be the best, you need two strikers. And I'd certainly be looking at those two um, next summer. But the opportunities, there were so many good players available this summer. And I think we got, you know, two or three. But I think it would have been a much better summer transfer. Well, Kim Min Jae would have been here for definite. Um, anyway, look, I could talk and talk about that. Fantastic video from Fabrizio as always. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I've got a very good video going up on that football in about 20 minutes if you want to check that out. Um, but I'm back at eight o'clock with you as well. So take care, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in this afternoon. Oh, I've got some really, really, really good content. I can't wait to, I've got a video that's going to be great. Um, um, probably won't be out today, probably tomorrow, but um, I'm really enjoying that. Um, anyway, I'll speak to you all at eight o'clock. Really good, really good updates there for a Monday in the international break. Scott McTominay turned Fulham down to stay at Man United. Pa player power at this football club. You know, I just want to say that. What's that all about? Harry Maguire stays at the club when Man United have agreed a fee because he hasn't been getting the payoff he wants. Scott McTominay would rather stay at United than go to Fulham when the club wants to sell him. What's going on at a club? where players are thinking, I'd rather sit on the bench at United than go and play football. How comfortable are we making it for these players that they've got no ambition to play first-team football? You've got to look at that. And I'm sure Ten Hag's looking at that. Why are players staying at Man United when I'm not going to pick them and they've got opportunities to go and play for Premier League clubs? Well, the answer is money, isn't it? It's money and they're too comfortable. Uh, United have got a lot of work to do. They've got a lot of work to do. I'll speak to you later. Thanks for watching.